Hello, ladies and gentlemen, my name is TV Skyn, and with uh, Evelyn's video, uh, video, visual and gameplay update coming out soon, Riot has seen fit, finally, to clarify some of her lore and give her a new and more consistent place within the League of Legends universe. Now, her biography, which we're not going to get too much into, TLDR, is that she, rather than being a mortal assassin creature of some kind, um, a, a, a resident of the actual world of Terra, who was born, presumably, and had parents and family and stuff, like, who is a kind of a person with superpowers, she is instead a superpower that has developed a personality, by which I mean she is a sort of primordial demonic force that feeds on pain and misery, and she has taken this human shape in order to go into the world and seduce people and then torture them and feed on their pain. So she's essentially a succubus kind of character now, where before she was sort of a mixed bag of a very conservative cartoonist's idea of what a dominatrix looks like mixed with some kind of badass shadow assassin mixed with someone who has a giant red onion on their head. It was, she was a little confused back then. Now they have refocused her so that everything from her lore to her character design is 100% about her being the sexy, seductress, succubus, sex demon of League of Legends, which which I think is quite nice. It, it It's a lot more coherent. It fits together a lot more. But the thing we're actually going to be taking a look at is her color story, her short story which is supposed to be a five minute read, but if you have ever watched these videos before, you know that that is not going to be true. However, we're going to try and make it a little bit briefer than usual. So for the purposes of this video, I'm going to assume that you have already read the story. If you haven't read the story, there's a link down in the description where you can go and read the story. And once you've done that, come back and we're going to talk a little bit about rather than going through each paragraph in turn, we're going to talk a little bit broader about stuff like theme and how the story is put together structurally and how well I think it works. Have you done that? Excellent. So the first thing to notice about the story is that it's a very straightforward structure. Like there's there's really not a lot of um, fanciness going on. If you remember back to the Cain lore, we discussed how it jumps back and forth in time um, and kind of tries to create a narrative by weaving different moments in time together. This one doesn't do that. It's an entirely linear narrative, and it's built around a sort of Goldilocks structure, a rule of three structure, which is to say she finds one potential victim as she's out looking for people to torture, and he's not quite good enough. And then she finds another potential victim, and she's not quite good enough. And then she finds a third one, and oh my word, this one is just right. Goldilocks structure. And the purpose of this is that each victim that she discards and every reason that the story tells us why she doesn't want to kill them and torture them tells us something about how Evelyn approaches pain and what pain means to her and the psychology that kind of underlies her. Which is to say, the first person is a blackout drunk lying in a gutter who can't really feel anything. And for Evelyn, it's not enough to just hurt and wound people. Like, she's not interested in just wounding people causing physical damage she wants them to feel pain and someone who's blackout drunk is not going to feel the pain therefore she's not interested the second victim potential victim is a woman who evelyn um says that um let's see where it is there was something deep inside her a melan a melancholy that would taint the experience, right? Evelyn preferred inflicting the pain herself, which tells us, okay, it's not enough to have someone where she can inflict pain. It also has to be a person who doesn't bring a lot of their own pain to the table, basically. Like, she wants to cause the pain. She doesn't just want to drink random pain from people. She doesn't go to, like, she wouldn't want to go to a battlefield full of wounded soldiers and just drink the pain of people who are already suffering from other things. She wants to cause the pain. That's important to her. And that's the function of those two, two first potential victims, is to show us something about the ways in which Evelyn picks her victims and what they say about her psychology. Very strong. It works quite nicely. Then we get to the third victim, who is the just right one. And that's where my structural problem with the story, or rather my stylistic problem, perhaps, starts coming in, because the gentleman who she chooses as a victim is presented as in this almost sort of impossibly perfect 1950s gorgeous nuclear family, wife and two children kind of way. Like, it kind of feels like there should be happy violin music playing whenever the him and, and, and the children and his wife are together, right? They were presented as this sort of incredibly saccharine, sweet, almost cartoonishly perfect 
victim that Evelyn wants to kill and hurt and maim. She sees this beautiful thing and she wants to tear it apart. And what the writer has done is perhaps gone a little bit too far. The gentleman was positively beaming as he exited one of the high-end pubs. He was dapper without being flashy and he hummed a jaunty tune to himself as he set off down the street with a bouquet of flowers tucked gingerly in the fold of his arm. And a slender austere woman in a high-necked evening gown entered and greeted the man with a welcoming embrace. She feigned slight surprise at the flowers he had brought before placing them in a clean vase right next to an old bouquet. A moment later, two children, scarcely out of diapers, ran into the room and threw their arms around the man's leg, their wide grin sparkling with tiny teeth. Right? And... This is like, it's ridiculous almost. It's kind of cartoonish. It's sort of, you know how in, in, in Saturday morning cartoons like G.I. Joe or He-Man or whatever, the villain is always sort of kind of ridiculously cartoonishly evil. Like they, they want to do evil just for evil's sake kind of thing. I'm gonna take over the world because I'm evil and I want to do mean things and bad stuff. Like that kind of over the top cartoonish evil. This is sort of the other end of the scale. This is sort of that cartoonish over the top wholesomeness. Right? It's it's kind of it's kind of this ridiculously holy shit no one is actually that happy kind of moment. And I think what the writer is trying to do is set up this line which is perhaps my biggest criticism um of the whole story. As Evelyn locked eyes with the man, she plumbed the depths of his soul and found exactly what she was looking for. That tiny lesion of discontent that festered within even the happiest person, right? That's the idea, that's the hook of, that. that's kind of the reason why the story can progress at all is because despite the seeming perfection of this man's life, there is a tiny lesion of discontent. Like there's, there's, there's something more he wants. He has, he has, some more desires that are not being met, and that is what Evelyn is going to use to seduce him, right? And my problem is that feels kind of at odds with the impossibly beautiful saccharine, because the whole point of presenting this almost ridiculously cartoonishly nice and pleasant and wholesome image of this gentleman and his family and his perfect wife and his perfect children is that Evelyn's evil is demonstrated by her desire to tear this beautiful thing apart, to destroy this beautiful thing. Right? That that's that's sort of the point of that is that Evelyn is evil because that this kind of beautiful, perfect, wonderful, lovely thing is the thing that she most wants to destroy. But then on the other hand, that tiny lesion of discontent that festered within even the happiest person. That's a very broad thematic statement to make. And when I say a broad thematic statement, what I mean is that this is the kind of thing that if you see that in a story, like that no matter how happy you are, there will be discontent and unhappiness within you. Like no, that, that's, a, that's a broad statement on the nature of the human condition. And what the story is saying is that the reason why Evelyn can be successful as a succubus and seductress and a torturer and, and, and being what she is, is because this flaw exists in all people. But that's not really earned is the trouble I have. It's not really earned. As far as the story has presented us so far, the man's life is perfect. Everything is good about him. He's happy. He has a wonderful family. Nothing is wrong whatsoever. But then when time comes to explain, okay, if, if he doesn't want anything, if he doesn't have anything that he needs, if he doesn't have anything that he's unsatisfied with, how can she possibly seduce him? She can't offer him anything if he already has everything. And it kind of feels like the story is pulling this out of its ass. It feels a little Deus Ex Machina-ish that, oh, how does she seduce him then? Uh, well, we just, we're just gonna state that every person is secretly unhappy a little bit, and that's why she can seduce him. It doesn't feel earned, it doesn't feel set up. And that's, that's sort of, that's sort of my trouble with it, is that it kinda can't decide whether it wants to go with all people are secretly unhappy as the crux of Evelyn, because if all people are secretly unhappy to some extent, then all people secretly bring some amount of pain to the table, right? But that's why she discarded the drunk woman, or the, the woman eating food, is that that woman was already suffering. She was already in pain, therefore Evelyn is not interested. But 
if she's only interested in causing pain to people who don't bring their own pain to the table, who are happy, who are content, who who have more to lose, then why then the story at the same time goes, no, but everybody is kind of unhappy. Everybody is, it's, there's always something, like you can't have that pure rush. And that seems kind of at odds with each other because the story never explores that further. So, yeah, that's sort of my primary problem with this thing. I do love th about this story is that Evelyn is clearly bisexual. In so I mean, she's not really a sexual person. She doesn't want to have sex. She wants to torture and murder people, but she's in... She'll do it to any gender, is the thing I like. I, I like that they didn't make her just, oh, she only tortures men because reasons. No, no. It's... She's an equal opportunity murderous demon torturer, and that's, that's very nice. It's quite nice to see, but... My suggestion um, for this, in order to earn that, oh, everybody is unhappy ass pull that was kind of not set up, that was not explained, that's never really touched on, because again, this it's such a broad statement, it's such a strong statement, like, that's, <clears throat> every person, no matter how happy, is unhappy secretly inside, there's always some unhappiness inside you, that's not like saying gravity is real, that's a, that's a value statement, on the state of humanity and the state of the world and like when I read something and I see something like that I'm going okay you're gonna have to explain like you're gonna have to justify that somehow which is what I'm gonna address imagine now that instead of the straightforward structure the fully straightforward structure we've got here that her victim is also a character in the story because right now he isn't a character in the story he really is he's 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 a uh, He's a function in this. He's a, he's an object in the story. He is who he's the person that Evelyn, who is the only character in the story, interacts with. But he's not a character. He's not fleshed out. He doesn't have an inner life. He doesn't have any kind of personality that we know of. He's just a victim who's there so that Evelyn can victimize him. Right? He's an object. What I would suggest was to be to characterize him. Now the story is going to become a lot longer. Um, with my suggestion, <laughs> which is probably something they want to avoid. This is the trouble with the short story, is that you really kind of can't do much within the confines of this much text. Like, you, you kind of have to pare down a lot, and that's a very difficult thing. But we're going to talk a little bit about that more, more lately. What I would suggest, when Evelyn finds this guy, he is, um, let's see, exiting one of the high-end pubs humming a jaunty tune with a bouquet of flowers tucked gingerly in the fold of his arm, right? So he has been out drinking, one assumes, or at least in some sort of liquor and beverage serving establishment. And he's got flowers for his lady, and he's going home. Now imagine he's in this bar with his friends. Imagine if there was a scene where, first of all, we get the guy's name. Um, he talks a little bit about what he's doing, how, how he feels, how excited he is to go home to his perfect family, uh, how excited he is to see his children or whatever. And, and we get some backstory on how did he and his wife meet and was it a really cute wedding? And like, so we get some more insight into how nice and wholesome and perfect these people are and how well they complement each other and what a cute couple they make. Because that will heighten the tragedy. What we want, what the story wants by presenting the character as so perfect and infallible with this wonderful family is to heighten the tragedy when it becomes clear that, oh, Evelyn is going to tear that shit apart and feast on the pain from having this beautiful thing torn apart. So by characterizing the guy, by making him a person, you can heighten that tragedy. You can make it more stronger that, oh, he's such a nice guy and now he's going to fucking die becomes stronger when you spend some time developing it rather than just saying, oh, he has a perfect life and a perfect wife and a perfect family. It's showing versus telling, essentially. And now imagine that also there is a scene where it is described that as he enters the bar, the pub, the high-end pub, he takes his wedding ring off. I don't know if wedding rings are a thing in Rune Terror, but imagine that that was the thing, that he takes his wedding ring off and he spends the time talking and flirting with the ladies. He doesn't ever do anything because he does love his wife and he does have a perfect marriage and he is very happy, but he does take his wedding ring off. Not because he wants to cheat on anyone, but just 
just because for some reason he just feels like he doesn't want to have it on when he's in the pub with his friends and chatting up the ladies and, and, and you know, having a good time. He just, uh, for some reason, he just doesn't want the wedding ring on. On. And then as soon as he leaves the pub, he puts it back on and goes home to his perfect wife and his perfect family and everything's fine. Because now you have earned that line that I had a problem with. Tiny lesion of discontent that festers within even the happiest person. Now you have shown us that this is so. That no matter how happy he is in his marriage, no matter how good everything is for him, he still takes off his wedding ring, right? He still can't quite can't quite find himself at ease. He's a little discontent with it. And that is the want, the need, the desire that Evelyn exploits in order to torture and murder his family. That would be my suggestion. And in order to do that, you have to break the very straightforward uh, structure. You don't have to break the um, rule of threes. You don't have to break the Goldilocks thing. But what you do have to do is take the perspective away from Evelyn. What I would do is I would open on that guy. I would open on him in the bar ch uh, chatting um, to people. And then as he exits the bar, maybe make a point of when, once he stepped out of the bar, he put his wedding ring back on. You, uh, he didn't quite know why he always took it off before he entered the bar, but it just felt uncomfortable somehow or something like some little line on that. And then you would have to intercut Evelyn searching for a victim with Scenes from the high-end pub where he's having a good time with his friends. Hanging out and maybe flirting a little bit. Um, and then once Evelyn finds him, then you merge the two disparate narratives into one. And maybe you do a, you can do a little bit more inner monologue with the guy. Uh, maybe for a moment, like uh, maybe in the street, a prostitute uh, solicits him. Goes, hey, mister, want a good time? And you can have a scene where he pauses just for a second. He doesn't stop, he doesn't go to her, he doesn't look at her or anything, he just pauses for a second and moves on. Because again, you're setting up that there is that tiny little lesion of discontent for Evelyn to get her hooks into. And then eventually you reach the same conclusion that Evelyn, um, he touched her face with the tips of his fingers, caressing her cheeks. She held his hand firmly to her skin and released a soft, sultry chuckle. This sweet, tender, happy man would be hers tonight. He had so much pain to give, and she would take it all. The deal had become even sweeter and the prospects more enticing. There was one daisy in full flower to pluck and one bulb to bloom while it watched. Implied threesome. Cool. Nice. Um, and then cut to black as we fade out. This would be my second major problem with the story is that the story is very happy to imply that Evelyn is about to do terrible, terrible, terrible things to these people. That she is extremely evil because she does terrible, terrible things to good people. But it stops short of showing us. There are reasons for this. First of all, this stuff is published in many languages across many cultures with a lot of different censorship laws that it has to take into account. And I suspect that is the reason why a lot of these short stories tend to be kind of bloodless. Like, there's not a lot of blood and gore and hardcore action or even a lot of swearing really going on in a lot of these because they have to pass censorship muster in a lot of different cultures on a lot of different continents across a lot of different cultures but nonetheless it's not that strong when you don't actually show the evil this is this is something we've talked about in discussing these lore stories before showing versus telling and what Riot has a problem with in these short stories a lot is that they like to tell rather than show. That is to say, if they need a character to be courageous, then somewhere in the narrative they will say, oh, the character is very courageous, rather than have a scene where the character displays courage. And in this story, they're happy to say, oh, Evelyn is evil, she's going to murder them all and dismember them and cause them tremendous amount of pain and torture them and maybe have sex with them, but mostly torture them. But it's not willing to show her doing any of it and that would be the thing that would really make the story land for me is not like it has to have a whole extended torture porn section where we talk about how she specifically tears off the man's arm very slowly while his wife is screaming and the children are crying nothing so graphic and 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 cruel but maybe just a little bit of maybe a cut to later kind of thing jump forward in time when she exits the house covered in blood 
And she goes and she can still hear the smallest child screaming in her head. It makes her chuckle. Something like that, where we actually are shown that, no, no, she has done the thing and it was spectacularly awful. You can still use implication and innuendo to get the message across, but I feel like the story would have been stronger if you actually saw her doing an evil thing. But that would also have made the story longer, much like my other suggestions. And that's where we come to the crux of the problem with the short story as a centerpiece of character lore. Because they are, unfortunately, at this state in Riot's lore development, the bios and the short stories are the centerpiece of character lore in the League of Legends universe. I would very much like it to be the comics that we talk about in some of the other videos. Uh, I would very much like those to be the centerpiece of lore because I love those and comics are a better format anyway, says the cartoonist. But right now it's these short stories, which are 5, 10, maybe 15 minutes for the really big and long ones, maybe half an hour for the really, really big and long ones when they really decide to really put in a bunch of extra effort. But when you only have five minutes and however many words this is, there's a limit to how much you can do. There's a limit to how much characterization you can get out of it. There's a limit to how much complexity you can have in the narrative. There's a limit to how many different things you can do with it because you only have this much space and you need to tell the primary story. <laughs> and all the suggestions I have made for improving this thing extend the story substantially. They add a lot more words to it. And from a purely, you know, user, persp user uh, perspective, it's kind of hard to convince the League of Legends community to read really long and involved short stories. You can't, it's hard to convince anyone, really, to read a novel on the internet. Plenty of people read novels, but not a lot of people do it in web browsers. Unfortunate fact, but nonetheless, it is a fact. I don't, I don't know the stats on exactly how many people actually read these things, but I suspect it's not nearly as many as perhaps uh, Riot's lore department would want. <laughs> and that's kind of the problem that there is with short stories. It's that Riot, on the one hand, they're not willing to go further with it. They're not willing to really blow it up and actually have some bigger stories, some, some something big and ongoing that really kind of digs deep into the character and their psychology and who they are and how they feel and what they do. But on the other hand, there's also kind of pressures to not do that. Like, it, there's a diminishing set of returns where probably if Riot did it, they wouldn't get very much out of it. And my takeaway from that basically is that Riot needs to find a better format to deliver its lore. <laughs> Honestly, that that that's the main thing, and I have a hundred million suggestions that I could come up with. Everything from like a ongoing narrative podcast, which I would hella listen to, to videos instead where the lore stories are read with just minor illustrations going on in the background. That would get a lot more attention. Tons of better ways to do it. Ultimately, this is a perfectly workable short story. It, it does the job it's supposed to do. It tells us the things it's supposed to do, but it doesn't do it with a lot of complexity. It doesn't do it with that much depth, unfortunately. And there are reasons for that, but it's still a weakness of the thing and of most of Riot's lore stories in general. And I really hope they find a way to fix it. I really hope the narrative team can think of a different set of, of methods for publishing this stuff, for getting this stuff out there, for developing the lore. Because as it stands, I really don't think it works well enough for the purposes it is meant to, like, to, to do the things that it is meant to do, which is make these characters real in our heads. Because as it stands, honestly, I get a lot more character out of most of the new champions and the updates that they release from, like, the Skin Spotlight's voice compilations than I do from these short stories, and that's a problem. Anyway, I think that's about all I had to say about the short story. If you have a comment or a disagreement or a question, anything you like, you can leave it down below. I try to read everything. I, well, I actually, I do read every single comment. Uh, I, I My channel is still small enough that I can actually do that, and I try to respond to everything where I feel like I have a, a useful response to give. So feel free to leave comments, feel free to subscribe, uh, and uh, you know, I'll see you in the next video. Come back sometime. I'm so lonely. <laughs>